Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Pages to Progress. It's uh, it's a project that we started where we read books, basically, and then we reflect on them. Today, I'm joined with Dee and with James. Um, we've been working on this journey together, working through the book, a long obedience in the same direction. Dee, do you mind holding it up for the audience to see? If you click the link in the description, you'll get the details on the link towards that book. Come join us on the journey. We'd love you. We'd love you to be able to come and experience the same lessons that we get from reading and even just offer your reflections if you can. Today, we're reviewing chapter four entitled Worship. And it's kind of based on Psalms 122, not kind of, it is based on Psalms <laughs> 122. Um, actually, before we go into the actual chapter, so we just off air james and i were having a conversation about the writer eugene peterson james do you mind sharing what you shared with me about what you initially thought about the writer oh, okay because i just think um, it would just add to a bit of the color of the author yeah sure uh i actually um haven't hadn't heard about eugene patters peterson before this book. this is my first book reading about him and so when i first started picking up the book and reading it it, it kind of struck me as a little bit um overconfident or arrogant, if you will, like, like he was too sure of himself, some of these statements. So I decided to look him up and I watched some interviews and his, um, who he was online. And, um, and suddenly then I, I, I totally got a different picture of him. He was just this humble, very insightful, um, powerful speaker, you know, soft spoken, but very powerful. And that suddenly changed my view of how I read this, um, and who he was um mm -hmm. yeah and i was just commenting as well that obviously you know at the time of writing and up until recently a very elderly uh minister in his mm -hmm. 80s and he, he passed away um not long ago and there's something about the wisdom of of the elderly that they I, the older you get the more you carry wisdom and uh, the more you carry authority and the wisdom that you offer people and he really does come from a very sensitive and personal place. And when you've done years and years and years of ministry, you kind of have a thing to offer. So Eugene Peterson, if you don't know, was the author of the paraphrase, the message Bible. Um, he was the one who, who decided to translate the whole Bible and put it in that version. So if you haven't yet seen the message, you can check that out. It's a modern day version of what the Bible uh, could sound like if it was written in today's day and age. So with that, let's jump into Psalms 122. Uh, James, do you mind reading Psalms 122? And then we can do some reflections. All right. It says, when they said, let's go to the house of God, my heart leaped for joy. And now we're here, O Jerusalem, inside Jerusalem's walls. Jerusalem, well-built city, built as a place for worship. The city to which the tribes ascend. All God's tribes go up to worship. To give thanks to the name of God, this is what it means to be Israel. Thrones for righteous judgment are set there. Famous David thrones. Pray for Jerusalem's peace. Prosperity to all you Jerusalem lovers. Friendly insiders, get along. Hostile outsiders, keep your distance. For the sake of my family and friends, I say it again, live in peace. For the sake of the house of our God, God, I'll do my very best for you. Psalms 122. And that is actually in the message version that Eugene Peterson has has written. Let's start with this because I, I found this, this chapter so rich in talking about the essence of worship. And I guess in the mixture of that is going to church. I have a question for both of you and I'm going to answer as well. What's your earliest, earliest memory of going to church? That's what I want to start with. What, what 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 comes to mind? What's your earliest earliest memory that you think you can go back to, of going to church? Any ideas? My earliest memory of going to church is, uh, putting putting on a pretty. I think I feel like I was like before definitely before first grade. I think maybe what I recall is maybe like, I don't know, three, four years old, mm -hmm. uh, putting on a pretty dress. Of course, my mom's putting it on me. 
got the stocking, the white stockings, the black you, dress Were you shoes. in America? No, this was in Korea. Oh, okay. Yeah, the white stockings, the black uh, dress, shiny black dress shoes. And what I remember is participating in the Sabbath school mm. and doing the, the hand gestures with sing, you know, the sing-alongs. That's right. what I remember. Mm. the very earliest that's so cool james what about what about uh, you yeah i think my earliest memory probably around four or five and just feeling uh very very fearful and reluctant to go to church because i was new and i didn't know anybody there none of the kids and frankly i was i preferred to watch uh sesame street on <laughs> the old uh, box right. <laughs> saturday morning and so yeah it was not a very pleasant experience i didn't want to go Interesting, interesting. Um, I I actually can't uh, remember anything probably before the age of ten years old going to church, but maybe maybe this is something for me that was was one of my earliest memories of my life. Full stop. I remember being drafted for a play um, in church, and it was kind of like a musical thing, like a modern day storytelling of the biblical stories. Um, the narrator was this owl that, um, you know, that that uh, I that had the lady had two coffee coasters on to to make her eyes look like owl eyes and, <laughs> and stuff like that. And I remember that we had to practice for singing and dancing all these Christian songs in order to tell the story of how Jesus um, came and and gave everything for us. And I remember being this shy, scared child who didn't really want to speak to anyone and who was very nervous, very self-conscious, but something about the stage and the lights and the, and the singing and the performing, it, it was my first experience of just kind of breaking out of my shell. Yeah. And I just remember feeling, Oh, I really like this. <laughs> I really like doing this being on stage and, and doing this thing. And obviously I never became a singer, but, the, 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 that was one of my earliest memories of just enjoying that moment. Um, I asked the question because church means different things for different people at different stages of their lives. And one of the things that Eugene Peterson does at the start of this chapter, he sets the premise to what many people think about church versus what is the reality and what I mean is, is that I think he does a really good job of setting the premise of talking about the reasons that we tend to hear why people don't go to church. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I related to it because I've heard a few of them and even made some of the excuses myself as to why I either don't go or do not want to go. I think number one on my list, because of the context of I grew up in quite strict conservative and sometimes judgmental churches was I hated going to church to be under the, 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 under the eyes of everyone and judged by everyone. And I remember feeling quite uncomfortable and still to this day, and to some degree feeling quite uncomfortable about going to church because this person is going to say something or do something or, and I remember feeling unsafe in a space um, where I should have felt safe. And there are, a bunch of other reasons which have made me uncomfortable. James, you just shared one reason when you were young as to why you didn't want to go to church. And I'm sure if we were to list all the reasons in our lives, why we, why we, why we didn't want to go to church, we could probably make a, a long list here and there, but Eugene Peterson kind of sums everything up in one statement which really just kind of shook me and i was just like yeah that makes sense he flips it on his head and he he tells us there is one reason why we should go to mm. church uh, so for both of you what, what's that reason that he says do, do you remember why we should go it's to worship god it's god yeah there are yeah. many reasons mm -hmm. there are many reasons why we shouldn't, but there's only one reason why we should. Um, so let's let's now go dig a dig, dig a little bit deeper mm -hmm. between let's delineate between going to church and <clears throat> worshiping. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, both of you, is the difference, if there is any? Mm -hmm. 
there is definitely a big difference mm. between just going to church and worshiping God. I mean, you know, the, I, there have been definitely times uh, or week, weeks or Saturdays in my life where I am in church and I know that I did not, that I felt like I did not worship mm -hmm. and where I was trying to, you know what, can I be really open? Yeah. <laughs> and just tell you this, okay? I mean, not, not, you know, but, you know, I think because there are definitely on Saturdays, on Sabbath, where I am so busy mm. just doing church, right? Because the right. responsibilities and, and especially when I am not able to sit and go through the, the praise, the sermon, all of that. And at the end of it, I I felt like I haven't worshipped. Mm. And there have been many times like that due to that reason. And I told myself, okay, I'm going to at least sit down and listen to the sermon. That, that was like no compromise there. Mm. But but still there have been times when, when I just couldn't help it, you know, that I needed to be out and preparing for the potluck. And, you know, so for me, I just, but, but now that sermons are getting um, <clears throat> recorded, I can always go back and listen, but it's still not the same as your sure. error, right? Mm -hmm. But I also told myself, and I'm, and I partly, I tell myself this narrative because I think I try to make myself be, feel better or, 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 and partly because I know that I personally believe this to be true is that, you know, even though I may not be sitting and going through the uh, praise and the, uh, the listening sermon and all of that, and when I'm out, you know, helping with the potluck and all of that preparation, I tell myself that I am still engaged in God's, in, in, in Sabbath and in worship in mm. that I am still in, in in the midst of serving God. This is this is for God. This is for you know. That's what I. Thank yeah, you for your it, candor. I appreciate yeah. that. It, I I definitely related to that. You know, when Eugene yeah. Peterson writes about the context of going to church, I feel like he's writing to individuals. I could be wrong. I feel like he's writing to individuals who aren't fully immersive in the church experience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I feel like as. Adventist or specifically as a small church in Adventism, we're so immersed into the culture of what it takes to get a Sabbath service going. Mm -hmm. um, someone is doing everything <clears throat> all the time. And sometimes there's a, the other side of the coin where we don't always experience the rest that the Shalom offers mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's the flip side of the coin. I think that Eugene Peterson speaks to the essence of heart worship that is so crucial when it comes to the notion of, at least it should be, coming to church, the notion of coming to God, worshiping him with people. The irony is the Seventh-day Adventist, sometimes we leave a Sabbath more exhausted than we should be <laughs> rested. Um, but I wonder... I wonder if that those are just healthy indicators for us to reassess how we're supposed to do this church service. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, you can go to church and not worship, um, but you don't have to go to church in order to worship. Mm -hmm. And and that's, and I guess the possibilities start to expand <clears throat> when we start recognizing. That what would what would it look like if we were to go to church to enjoy the blessings of community and worship? Mm -hmm. I think this is partly what Eugene Peterson talks about on page forty four. I highlighted something when he talks about the the average mentality <coughs> that people have. Um, he says, but we do know that much of what we commonly describe as Christian behavior is not volitional at all. It's enforced. Now that describes the unhealthy context. But then he goes on to say, but worship's not forced. Everyone who worships does so because he or she wants to. They are, to be sure, a few temporary co uh, coercions, children, spouses who attend church because another has decided that they must. But these coercions are short-lived. A few years at most. Most Christians worship voluntarily. 
maybe that speaks to the notion of how we have become so naturalized into this process of coerced worship on a Sabbath. We get up, we do Sabbath school, we we turn up on time, we, we, we sing, we, we saw out the AV, we have our potluck, and then we shake hands, we go home. It's like our thing that we do on a regular basis. And maybe this is a light bulb that helps us turn on what well, where are we missing the worship in these in these spaces? James, did you have any thoughts, any additions you wanted to add? Oh, I think that's spot on. Yeah. yeah. Be okay. Nice for us to every now and then pause and yeah. Make sure we are aware that we are voluntarily um mm -hmm. worshiping. Mm -hmm. Okay. He talks a little bit about the framework um that we need in order to worship. Um he he kind of builds this notion um of the, the the architectural structure of the church and how tightly knit everything is and then he kind of sums up what is true architecturally on page 46 is also true socially for the sentence continues to which the tribes ascend all god's tribes in worship in all the different tribes functioned as single people in a harmonious relationship in worship Though we come from different places and out of various conditions, we're demonstrably after the same things, saying the same things, doing the same things. Here's the value that I got, the nugget that I kind of got from this. Coming together in worship is has become the greatest equalizer of humanity that has ever existed on this earth. That is why there is there is no space for us when we come together to worship to compare and say rich poor you know uh, cultural divide country divide we all come together under one common commonality to rob ourselves from the diversity and richness of god's image being expressed is something that is sad if we pull away from and i'm not sure that we get the full value of humanity when we live our own exclusive lives. One illustration is like this. You're, most of us have a social media of some kind, um, but when you go onto my social media and you look at the friends that I follow, you'll notice that I follow people whom I agree with <laughs> mm -hmm. and who have the same values as me. In a worship space, I'm brought together with all kinds of different people, and it forces you to be in a space where you can meet scripture under different values and mediums and ideas and work out how God is speaking to all of our individual lives. That's my reflection on the mm -hmm. diversity of what worship offers. How did you both respond to the diversity that worship offers? Do, what kind of great values do you think is being drawn out in the spaces of worship when different people are called together? Mm. Yeah, it, you know, this talks about the framework and upon which we um, um, view life and live life. And I think one of the things that really brings out uh, all sorts of backgrounds and peoples when worship is um, really the object of worship. I think that's really what uh, unifies. Um, in fact, I know there's many, many frameworks and structures in life, uh, religious and non-religious, but I would like to contend that, hmm, are as Christians framework and structure is particularly um, solid and unmovable and eternal, if you will, because of the very object of our worship. Mm. Um, Definitely. Yes. I, I, you know, I, I met many individuals where uh, who suffer from anxiety and depression and um, hopelessness in life because they've lost this framework for life. Um, and many people find it in different places, but um, whether we realize it or not, I think a lot of us who um, appreciate and are able to engage in worship, it it does create that truly peace-providing foundation framework um, because of the very object of our worship. Mm -hmm. Right. Dee, any any thoughts? If not, I, I mean, I think when we talk about diversity, Yes, I mean, everyone is different. Everyone has their own, you know, uh, background, life experiences and all of that. But I mean, unless 
like us growing up, right? Me growing up, I went to, I mean, Korean church, basically. It was a Korean speaking church, although we did have a small uh, separate group for the kids because we spoke English, right? But for the parents, it was, and it couldn't be helped because they were immigrants and English was not first language. So obviously, you know, they had to be in a mm -hmm. Korean church. And um, so I honestly did not, I, I honestly cannot say I grew up with diversity per se in the church, but I think um, probably... Maybe not cultural diversity. Not, not cultural diversity, no. But the reality but is even, we all have individual stories that we come to one place. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. That, that In that sense, I agree, but... I don't know, to, to be, again, to be quite transparent, I almost growing up in that church, always there was this pressure to just conform and be like everyone else and, right. and don't stand out. Right, a coercion. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. I, I, for yeah. me, like our current church, I don't feel that way. I think that there's much more uh, diversity even among you know us growing up you know Korean American and then you know we have other culture mm. as well but if beyond that just as individual individual person as a family is there, there is much more diversity I think yeah I there's definitely there's definitely a lot of resonation with that guys um Eugene Peterson goes on to talk about Psalm twenty, or Psalm one two two, kind of carries a tone that God has. I'm curious, how do you feel about God's command to worship Him? How do you feel about God commanding you to worship Him? Well. Anytime someone commands me, I, I feel like pushing back naturally. <laughs> mm -hmm. But 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 I think this is different. I don't think it's a it's a coerced um in other words, the reality is, you know, I, I love that Peterson talks about reality and lies. We talked about that in previous chapters. And the reality is that God is our creator. He made everything, everything good he made, um, our life and our restoration, our second chance, our salvation. And we have much reason to praise him and worship him. I mean, just naturally. I mean, if, if truly one was thankful and um, felt that personal love, one couldn't help um, praise and worship someone who did that for you. Um, I almost think of this command as sort of a, a gentle reminder of what, if I don't know, if I'm just so simple that I don't know how to react, mm. uh, what is the proper, you know, what, what would be acceptable? What would, what would be a, a good way to express and act upon that gratitude and that reality, that reality mm. that uh, God's just saying, just praise and worship me. And, and I'm in agreement. And I, mm. um, it, it's something that naturally should flow out. Um, but maybe maybe there's another point. I'm not sure, but that, that's how I felt. Uh -huh. I, I have a question against that, but I want to give a chance to D to answer as well. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel about the command to worship God? I've... I, for me, I don't think that it's unnatural. I think he has every right to commend it, he is our creator God, hmm. and and you know me knowing who he is as far as what I know of him, what I know about him, he deserves that worship from me. Hmm. He deserves so much more. Um, so I I want to I I'm, I want to keep worshiping him. Okay. So yeah. my follow-up question to both you and James and me, as I was thinking about this, I'm I'm just about a millennial and I'm with James. The notion of anyone commanding me to do anything <laughs> is is just, that's a recipe for disaster. I will not do it. Um, what if I feel like I do not want to worship? 
What if I'm not feeling like I want to be in the space to worship? Do my feelings matter? And can you can you still worship if you don't feel like it? I mean, you know, the author makes a distinction between you know, what he right out says feeling is something that's not reliable. So feeling cannot be trusted when it comes to religion, right? He says mm -hmm. that. Uh, I don't think that I 100% agree with him, but um, it's just like, I mean, we all go on, I think we all have uh, worshipped or gone to church when we don't feel like it. And to be quite honest, there have been times where the experience turned out to be positive. And mm. there have been times when experience did not turn out to be positive. Mm. <laughs> okay. But it's at the end of the day, I think that if your heart is not truly in it, you're, I think you're missing out, you mm. know, but at uh, the same time, I do agree with this author that there's times in your life when you, even though you don't feel like doing something, you go ahead and do it. Mm. And the feelings do follow later on. Right. That, I mean, even I have experienced that. I've seen other people who experience it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. It's, I get yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, if, if, if I had read this statement in isolation, um, you know, he talks about this. For example, worship is an act that develops feelings for God. You know, the act is more important. I would have in isolation thought, oh, that this is getting into legalistic kind of thinking and legal. That's how I honestly would have felt before I read this chapter. Mm -hmm. But man, you got to read this chapter in the whole, right? Because um, it, I, in fact, another statement, it, 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 again, in context, it would have been, I would have been like, no way. He said, um, feelings are completely unreliable in matters of faith. Mm. Feelings are completely unreliable in matters of faith. And a faith failure, I would have been like, wait, wait, wait a minute. My feelings don't count. Come on. But it matters of faith. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, the best way I can understand this is um, actually, again, my relationship with my wife. Um, love, the love relationship between us that, yes, there are times when I don't feel like expressing my love or showing my love. Like maybe... Um, our anniversary or her birthday, you know, mm -hmm. maybe I had a bad day or something and I just don't feel like making dinner or preparing something to tell her that I love her, that she's special, but the loving relationship, it's not always about a feeling. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the, the long-term commitment. It's, it's the trust of each other. And, and you just, you know, you live with each other. That's the act. And, and, um, so I, I think similarly, yes, there are days where I want to sleep in and on Saturday mornings and I don't want to go to church and I don't feel like saying hi and, you know, greeting and singing and dressing up and going. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, just doing it, I always come back home saying, oh, I'm so glad I went and worshipped. I'm so glad I went to church. I'm so glad I fellowship because it, it's always a blessing. It's always mm -hmm. a blessing. And so I think Peterson, I agree. I, I had to think about it, but you know, sometimes you act the acts of worship and the feelings follow, mm. or I should rather say, in my view, the blessings follow. <laughs> right, 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 right. Just another quote to add to it near to what James quoted on page 48. We can act ourselves into a new way of feeling much quicker then we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. I wrestled with that, you know, I had to really wrestle with that, but you know, I'm soon to be married and I, I definitely, definitely agree with the notion of as a, the, the little I understand about relationships more and more, you know, commitment is that one thing that really just jet propels you into the art of loving, I should say, yeah. because yeah. it, I, I do think it, it it is an art to some degree, um, and there's something about the beautiful response of act of your actions that enable you to feel quite deeply. And I think that God provides a window into what His love really means through relationships um, that we have with each other. 
um, here on planet Earth. And I think there's something definitely valuable in that. He makes a case, Eugene Peterson, for the notion of the purpose of worship. I love the quote on page 50. He says, worship does not satisfy our hunger for God. It wets our Sorry. appetite. Our need for God is not taken care of by engaging in worship. It deepens. Our need deepens. And I just thought, I just thought that is so beautiful because the amount of times I have come to God in a in a in a place of worship that has been devised versus something that is organic really has made the difference. I'll give an example from my life. I'm a pastor. I get paid to lead a congregation. I get paid to preach, to teach, to to offer spiritual spaces, to do all of the above. Sometimes the art and the act of preparing a sermon can be like the cogs just turning for me. Like if I ask any one of you two to prepare a sermon, I think it would be completely different because it's not your everyday thing. It's not, you know, for me, this is a, a process that begins from the minute I get off the pulpit on a Sabbath mm -hmm. to the following week. So this week I started something new and different that I've been trying. And so far it's only been day two, but it's been absolutely amazing for me. I have been praying through the Psalms. So what I've been doing is I've been taking the Psalms one by one and I have had my eyes open reading the Psalms and I have been using the language of what is written on the page in the Psalm as my prayer to God and expanding on those words. I'm not doing this for Eastside. I'm not doing this to present or for a sermon or anything like that. I'm just doing it for me and God. And the rich value that I find mm. in just this space where I'm worshiping, not for anyone, but just to have this space between, it's so, so beautiful. This what I'm doing and my ability to speak to God. And yeah, I feel exactly like the writer Lord because dot, 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 mm. you know, and I feel like there is an essence of worship that requires of an individual in order to have authenticity to deepen the need or at least put the flashlight on the darkness of our lives to notice the need for which God can whet the appetite for it. I think that's what I want to say. I hope I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we need to start to cultivate those spaces for our lives to recognize um, uh, uh, how we can improve on our worship. You know, D, you mentioned you and you were quite honest. Sometimes coming to church can be quite exhausting because of the various different things that we have to do. I wonder if those are then those key moments for us to make a decision and say, okay, so what can we do to try and improve on this space so that it doesn't become an overwhelming job, but it comes a beautiful appetite that we are trying to maintain and develop and deepen, knowing that God can fill that place. Does Do you guys relate to what I just mentioned too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is why, you know, for the way I worked it out for myself is when I'm in those situations is that recognizing uh, the, uh, I think it's the truth, recognize the truth that this is a, just another form of worshiping God. Mm. It's, that's what I tell myself. Sure. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. James, any final thoughts? Before we wrap up, anything else that popped out to you? Um, no, other than, you know, just um, towards the end where he talks about shalom and mm -hmm. shalva, which are yeah. peace and prosperity, mm -hmm. uh, that, um, you know, as worship whets our appetite to deepen our relationship with God. And he says, interestingly, that it's that need that deepens for God is expressed through our desire for peace and prosperity mm. Mm. I, I found that very very uh insightful and interesting sure yeah. and and just to add to that um prosperity he articulates is not something that 
you know, immediately comes to mind as some kind of, uh, he says, it's, it's got nothing to do with insurance policies or large bank accounts or stockpiles of weapons or whatever it is. It's actually a word that's more closely related to the word leisure um, and a, kind of a relaxed way of viewing things. This is what worship should try and bring out the sense of peace and, and calm. And to be honest, it kind of describes where I'm at, when I'm at the top of a mountain yeah. and you're just kind of looking out after a long hike, um, a rigorous long hike, you get yeah. to the top and it almost doesn't matter if it's cold or whatever it is. You hopefully you wrap up, but you just, there's this moment where you just pause and you look out and you just take in the awe and splendor and beauty of everything. Wow. And I, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if every single week, you know, after the long hike from Sunday to, to, to Friday, you make it to Sabbath, you step into the building, you sit down. And even if you are participating, there's this moment where you just pause at some point in the service um, as you're worshiping with everyone and you just take a deep breath and you just take in the awe and the splendor of who God is. That's mm. the goal. Wow. That's the goal. That's the yeah. goal. And I think, yeah. I think this chapter has awakened a lot in me. I hope it's awakened a lot in you as well about the action that needs to take place for us to be able to achieve that container on a Sabbath. Mm. Because I think it does require radical action. If we are so lost in the motions of worship or Sabbath or going to church, I think we need to revisit a few things. Um, yeah. I want to thank you so much for joining us on this small epic adventure of the book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Do You can hold up the book for our viewers again. You can click the link in the description. This is the book that we're going through by Eugene Peterson. It's definitely something that soothes our soul. His words resonate with us, and we hope they resonate with you too. Um, join us next week for another episode of Pages to Progress, Chapter 5, uh, which is entitled, I'm looking for it, Service. Service. Mm -hmm. Chapter 5. But until then, we wish you a good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wh whatever time you're listening to us. Um, this has been Pages to Progress. God bless you. We'll see you soon.